Okay. Um, so we'll get started. Um, hello. I, so I'm Christy Martin, Rachel Carson, class of 88, computer science major. Um, I'm still here in the Santa Cruz area, and I run a consulting company that provides technology services for NBC Universal. So I'm super excited for today's talk. Um, I'm also a member of the UCSC Alumni Council, which serves as the Alumni, Alumni Association Board and organizes volunteer committees to support student success and alumni success, um, networking and fundraising for the Alumni Association Scholarship Fund. So this fund is super near and dear to my heart. And this year we were able to give out 49 scholarships to both freshmen and transfer students, which is yay. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to introduce Larry Wilson, Porter class of 75. Uh, Larry and I discovered that we're both from Southern California and we were college five and eight before they had their more interesting names that they have now. <laughs> so we date ourselves a little bit. Um, Larry's an Emmy nominated performer, was recognized as the 2017 Comedy Magician of the Year. Very impressive. And a little 420 day fun fact, he created a reimagined version of Alice in Wonderland that used magic for the psychedelic storytelling at Harrah's in Reno and brought him to where he lives today in the Reno Tahoe area. Um, so as part of his experience in the entertainment industry, Larry saw the power of effective communications and he developed the Wilson method. So today he's gonna teach us what that is and some new skills. Take it away, Larry. Larry, you're still on um, mute. How about now? Great. Very good. Well, so we've overcome our first technological hurdle of the day. I consider this a great accomplishment. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm delighted to see how many people are turning out for this. It's a, it's a very exciting thing for me because my journey from Santa Cruz has been a very unusual one. And I was very, very pleased when uh, Barbara Oden and other people from the alumni committee reached out to me because I think this is a, could not be more pertinent to our lives, the things that I've been teaching the last few years. Um, this is called Hollywood's Best Kept Communication Secrets for a very real purpose. In fact, let me show you something. Well, maybe I won't. Perhaps our good friends at Microsoft have a different plan in mind. Bear with me a moment as I, there we go. Let's take this back. Just there we go. Here you see a great many luminaries of the entertainment business. There's a lot of them. Some of them you recognize, some of them may seem very old school. Well, if you guessed me, then of course you would be right. These are people I've worked with throughout my career, which astonishes me as much as anyone. I did not plan to do this, but I went to Santa Cruz and studied filmmaking. When I returned to my home in Los Angeles, everyone had just graduated with a degree in filmmaking and uh, Jobs were, well, there were a few jobs, but they didn't pay any money. You were just hoping to have a credit for having worked on them. But what happened was I fell sideways into performing and had enormous success with it right away. So I assumed, oh, it's just a fluke. This isn't really going to last. Yet here we are all these years later Apparently I was wrong. Apparently something was going on. When I was uh, voted comedy magician of the year in 2017, I kept thinking someone made a mistake, but 
apparently it was too late for them to go back and change it. So I want to show you again, I'm, I'm going to back up this slide because I want you to look at these people. You see, there's a lot of heavyweight entertainers there, actors, singers, writers, performers, dancers, comics. It's quite an extraordinary array of people. And one of the things that may be the fundamental best kept secret of Hollywood communication secrets is that I kept seeing again and again that these people as talented as they were did not rely on talent. I was as surprised as anyone. What I learned very quickly was, and you'll see there's there's Academy, I see Carl Malden up there, two Academy Awards. Uh, Tim Hutton, one Academy Award Best Actor. These are some very heavyweight, talented people, but they relied on technique. And this is good news because technique is transferable. Technique is duplicatable. Uh, as I was speaking earlier to Christy Martin, I said, I wouldn't know how to teach anyone to be talented. I don't know how you do that. But I realized, oh, any technique I could teach someone. And during the course of my strange and checkered career in entertainment, I kept seeing certain trends emerge. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you more about this story and how this came to be. It's really not that complicated, but it is unexpected. I'll start with these two lovely people, my mother and father. This photo in many ways tells you all you need to know. They're both very, very good people. My mother, the sweetest person I've ever met, not a particularly good communicator, but so full of love for everyone that she connected with people. My father, a famous and esteemed psychoanalyst, did not have the ability to connect with people the way my mother did. And in fact, I'm not sure how much he was able to feel things that normal people feel. He wasn't a bad person. He just wasn't able to feel those kinds of feelings. And so he, I suspect this may be the root of his enormous success and his incredible competence as a psychoanalyst because he was able to listen to people share the most horrible thoughts, feelings, uh, accounts of childhood trauma without becoming emotionally involved because he didn't become emotionally involved. I don't think he was able to be emotionally involved with people, but that's particularly helpful as a psychoanalyst. I remember meeting someone uh, after I was grown, I ran into one of his patients who spoke in the most glowing terms. I met a number of them actually when I was grown up. They never said he helped them. They, he, they never said, oh, he was a really good therapist. They all said, he saved my life. So he had a profound effect on people, but he himself was not able to feel these things. And it left me as a child with a very a distinct desire not to be like that. I love them both very much, but I wanted to learn how to connect with people so that I wouldn't wind up like my father. Of course, <laughs> this is the logical, I guess it's logical delineation that brought me to this. This is just a little bit for those of you who may not be familiar with me. Larry Wilson here. 
I'm extremely proud that my wife, Nicole, and my son, Joss, are now able to pursue their dream. That was my goal. That was my objective. That they could do what they love in life without compromise. The thing that makes them feel fulfilled. Not just their passion, but with a sense of purpose. I do the same thing with my clients because I was looking for that purpose. And I found my answer in a most unlikely place, on stage in the biggest theaters and sound stages from the most famous stars and celebrities in the world. I learned a skill set that is very unique, and that is how to communicate in a way that makes you impossible to ignore and invisible no more. I've dedicated my entire life to mastering these communication skills that open the doors of opportunity. And after 25 years teaching these skills internationally, I've never had a single failure. The reason for my success with people of virtually any background or age is that my techniques, my systems, my processes don't require talent. They're all entirely technique-driven. If I learned anything from 40 years in show business, it's that you don't need talent. You need technique. I look forward to sharing my life's work with you. A life's work that is transferable. A life's work that is duplicatable. A life's work that will empower you to win the recognition of people who will fall in love with you. Who will offer you job opportunities you've never had. Allow you to generate the income and freedom to live a life of consciousness that you've never been able to embrace. To become a master communicator full of humor and life and love. I'm Larry Wilson, father, husband, author, speaker, and trainer. With over four decades of experience speaking and performing on stages around the world and on TV, I would love to gift you some of my life's work online now, where you'll receive free trainings, motivation, and other priceless gifts that will open the doors for you to experience your life in HD. Well, it, it sounds so easy, doesn't it? Of course, like anything else, it's easy once you know how it's done. It's also a, applies to magic tricks as well. Some of the most baffling, once you know how it's done, it's very easy. So, the problem is, right now, in 2021, so many friends of mine, some of them banana slugs, are underemployed. Some people lost their jobs. Some people's hours have been cut back. Or I talked to quite a few people who are on the cusp now of making a change. I guess that shows how old we are, that some of them are just about to consider retiring doesn't mean they want to stop doing things. It just means that they're ready for a change. The problem, of course, so many of you locked down at home with the only lifeline you have is the questionable benefits of the internet. And that a struggle, if, you've, if you're an entrepreneur, if you have your own business or do things, I, I saw Christy Martin there has a software consulting, a technological consulting thing for NBC. That's extraordinary. Well, it's a huge challenge trying to do this and earn a living over the internet. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to take some of these things I've learned over the last 40 years, put them together in a way that anyone can use them, learn from them. In fact, the solution somehow, despite the internet, to make yourself impossible to ignore and to triumph over those technological problems in trying to conduct business online so that you can live your life by your design uh, as opposed to living your life by default, which I saw a lot of in the entertainment field, people who had not thought about what it was they wanted to do. So 
what is the solution? What's this? Warren Buffett has information. I don't know about you, but if Warren Buffett has something to say about how you can increase your worth by at least 50%, I'm all ears. There's one tip that you can give them in any it, realm of life. It's very simple. <clears throat> Invest in yourself. And uh, the one easy way to become worth 50% more than you are now at least is to hone your communication skills, both written and, 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 and verbal. I mean, uh, you can, if you can't communicate, you know, it's, it's like winking at a girl in the dark, nothing happens. You know? <laughs> so you got so you can have all the brain power in the world, but you gotta be able to transmit it. And the transmission is, is, is communication. Well, I just want to reemphasize that because it tickles me so much. Um, Warren Buffett says, doesn't matter how much brain power you have, if you can't transmit that information, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens. We could spend an hour talking about that, but we won't. Uh, but I also thought it was incredible that the world's most successful investor says, oh yeah, you can increase your value right now by 50% by improving your communication skills both written and verbal. I can't argue with him. He knows what he's doing. So I created this Wilson method that I have been using and training people in the last uh, four or five years, but always in person. So it is a particularly gratifying for me to be here with you online talking about this very first endeavor I created. Well, it was really started a year ago by the pandemic lockdown. Truly anything you want can be yours. I know it seems perhaps uh, too simple to be true, but it is the truth. My experience in life, and I don't say it's the only valid experience, I can only speak from my own experience, is that communication is where everything begins. Everything. So when I say it's up to you, of course it is up to you. I put together this program I called Remote Control Revenue. And I teach a, a number of Wilson Method techniques, but it's a great entry point for Wilson Method because it's sort of a, a two, a track process. On one hand, you're learning through modules, a bunch of Wilson Method basic technique that anyone can do. And at the same time, I present strategies that are designed specifically for earning a living online. The question is, how do we do it? And if you're ready, I'll teach some to you right now. I say that there are three C's in Wilson Method. And this sometimes is helpful as a touchstone. If in the training you get lost or you forget what you were doing or you get distracted, we wanna be able to connect with people before you've even spoken a word so that you can communicate your message and then create authentic bonds. None of it's very complicated. Let's begin with connecting. Online, more than ever, eye contact is absolutely mission critical. These marvelous pocket computers we all have, have some downsides to them. Not the least of which is we have a tendency to become focused on interactions that do not involve eye contact. I'm sure that a number of you 
have been on Zoom calls this last year where someone either has just a still photo of themselves up, that's understandable. Maybe they don't look their best or maybe they can't arrange for whatever, that's under. But then I've seen video where someone's on the call wearing sunglasses. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this. I'm just saying it depends on what you want to accomplish. If you wanna connect with people, we have to be able to see your eyes. And the first time this was brought home to me so clearly, here's Timothy Hutton, triumphant winning his Academy Award as best actor. I worked on a film with him that none of you ever saw. I only say this because I've never met anyone. I think it was called uh, Playing God. Uh, Tim Hutton and David Duchovny, I can't, oh, and a very young Angelina Jolie was in it too. I worked with Tim for about a month on some stuff for this film. And it was a very interesting experience for me because I saw uh, some techniques that Tim used day in, day out, not just on camera. One night, he and I had been working all day. It was evening and we we're in Malibu at his place. And he said, oh, you wanna go get some dinner? I said, yeah, sure. So we jumped in the car, drove nearby, some swanky Malibu place. This is a Friday night. It was packed. And I should point out, it was packed with everyone famous. It wasn't just a normal neighborhood situation. So there was no way we were gonna walk in and get a table. And I saw this poor woman who was the maitre d' and surrounded by people. And I saw Tim walk up to her and then he came back and he said, oh, they're gonna seat us right now. And we went to our table and I said, okay, you have to tell me what was it? What did you do? He said, nothing. I, I said, did you give her money? He said, no. I said, what did you do? He said, I made eye contact with her. And I thought, okay, well, that's not it because that's too simple, right? And he said, no, he said, everyone there, if you notice, they aren't even looking at her. They're barking orders at her and they're wheedling and they're whining and they're pleading, but no one's looking at her. He said, I walked up, looked directly at her and said, oh, it's a mob scene in here tonight, isn't it? And, or something like that. And she said, oh yeah. And just by speaking with her for a moment, by looking directly at her, she had a different experience with him. Now, I know there's some of you are gonna say, well, can't be that easy. Oh, but it is. Paradoxically, it's not as easy to do as you think it is. Some of you are saying, well, yeah, I make eye contact all the time. Well, you might wanna practice. You might wanna set up your phone or a video camera and record yourself talking into it. Then play it back and take a look at how much you avoid the camera, how much you look away, turn your head, move your face around. Everybody does this. Why? Well, because that single unflinching eye of the camera feels like it's judging you. It's unconscious. We're not thinking of it consciously. But when you start to think about it and practice looking directly into the camera, people on the other end, whether it's on a Zoom call, whether it's on a FaceTime call, whatever it may be, they have a different feeling about you. And again, this is the sort of thing you can practice today. You'll be astonished. I, I had one student uh, who was great, who was uh, involved in, uh, she had to make videos of cosmetic products that she represented. And she worked so hard on looking directly in the camera and being relaxed and she was great. But we realized when we looked at the video, she had not practiced just before she started her presentation and just after. And she was still doing these micro avoidance movements. 
it's a way of trying to escape from the unflinching eye of the camera. I didn't understand the importance of eye contact until I worked with Larry Wilson. He deconstructed it and he taught me how to use it to my advantage in every communication. Uh, you know, more importantly, once you have made that initial connection, then you need to communicate. And of course, again, it may seem so obvious, but you have to ask yourself, what is it you're communicating? What, what's your intent? Today, I thought we'd try something very simple, very easy, very straightforward, that again, some of you may laugh at. You may say, well, <laughs> this is absurd, I can do this. But you'll be surprised. And that is to ask for what you want. Now, I know from speaking with many of you that there's some of you who already are well aware say, I have a hard time doing this. That's the first step towards realizing you need a technique that you can practice that you can get better at. The people who aren't aware of this limitation will have a harder time. Uh, the people who say, oh yeah, I asked for what I want, I don't know. But what's interesting in a live training, I'll go around the room and ask people, I'll give them some arbitrary thing to ask for. I'll say, uh, I want you to ask for a raise or something. And when you hear them, it's funny, I'll record them and play it back. I'll say, you're not really asking for that. Some of you are suggesting that you should get a raise. Others are, of you are making a, an argument that you deserve a raise or um, presenting a lovely idyllic picture of how great things will be once you get a raise. All of that may be true. I don't mean to suggest that your feelings, your thoughts about this are invalid. They aren't. They absolutely valid. They make a great deal of impact, but they do not help you get what you want. This, of course, I learned from this woman, strangely enough. Many of you may recognize Katie Seagal, from just about everything. I always think of her bursting forth on the scene with uh, married with children, but uh, Sons of Anarchy and uh, in my family, she's a big hit on Futurama, which is an animated show, but uh, Katie and I go way, way back. And when Katie first kind of exploded with uh, married with children, I remember being at a party at her house I remember distinctly because it was in Beverly Glen in Los Angeles and there was no parking. We all had to park miles away and hike down to her house. But I was talking with her and just saying, you know, how great things were for her. And she said, you know, Larry, I made a big mistake. Now, I know something about Katie Seagal that you don't know. She's incredibly talented actress, comedian, presenter. She can do really anything she needs to do. She can do comedy, she can do drama. But what you may not know is that she's an incredible singer. She has an unbelievable singing voice, incredible R&B sound since she was a little girl. But people don't know about that as much. And that night at that party when Katie said to me, yeah, I made a big mistake. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I thought since I was becoming successful doing all this acting that people would offer me opportunities for my singing. And she said, that's not how it works. She said, I should have asked them directly for that. Now, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for Katie. She's had an extraordinary career and she sings and performs and has albums, but the impact on me never ever left. Hearing that from someone who had such extraordinary success, I realized, oh, 
that's a logical feeling. Oh, they'll see I do these other things, they'll offer them to me. No, you have to ask for what you want. I'm happy to say that Larry helped me personally craft the words and presentation for a proposal that allowed me to ask for a larger performance fee than I thought I could get, and I got it. Indeed he did. Now, this brings us, of course, to our third takeaway, which is to create authentic bonds. And this story, this story almost seems impossible, but it's not hard to do. All of you can do this. I promise you, you can. You use your ears. You use active listening. I learned this from this man, Hugh Hefner. I had just graduated from UC Santa Cruz. I'd gone back to Los Angeles. A girl I knew invited me to come along with her to a party at the Playboy Mansion. And she said, oh, I mean, there were hundreds of people there. It was jam-packed and music, and it was a, a big hopping scene. And uh, this girl said, oh, I want you to meet Hef. And I thought, yeah, Hef doesn't want to meet me. She said, no, no, he's great. You're really... So she drags me up and he goes, Hef, this is my friend Larry I was telling you about. And he turns to me and he goes, oh, hi. And he said, oh, uh, Debbie tells me you just... Uh, graduated from uh, college. And I said, uh, yeah. And he said, what was your major? I said, oh, uh, filmmaking. And he said, oh, do you like film noir? And I said, now I had just taken uh, the esteemed Tim Hunter was my, one of my film professors at Santa Cruz in those days. And he had presented a whole course on film noir, which was eye-opening earth shattering. It was incredible. And I said to Hefner, I said, I love film noir. And he said, don't you think Gloria Graham is the most luminous creature you've ever seen on screen? I said, yeah. I said, now tell me something. Why do you think she didn't become as huge a star as other people of that time? And he said, well, he said, I think that she didn't look the same as them, you know? She, her face shape, and she was blonde instead of a brunette, and there were just things about her. And next thing I know, Hefner and I are standing in the middle of this party in this crowd of hundreds of people talking film for 40 minutes. I finally looked around and realized all these people are looking at me with daggers in their eyes, like they want me out of there. And so I just said, oh, oh, I said, you know what, I, uh, this has been so great, but I, I didn't want to monopolize your time. And I just really wanted to say hi. And, you know, it's really great meeting. Thank you for having me at this party. And he said, oh, great, Larry. It's really nice to meet you. And turned and went away. Now, I have no idea what really was going on with him. I can only tell you how it made me feel. First of all, I knew I would never forget this guy. But I, you can see he's an ordinary looking man, but I instantly tumbled to the fact of why he'd had such incredible success with women. Because when he spoke to you, you felt as if he really heard you and saw you. It, had an enormous impact on me. And he did it by actively listening. Now, I know there's some people who might say, well, uh, you know, what if, uh, what if you'd said you graduated in film and you didn't know anything about film? I guarantee you what he would have said. He would have said, I don't know anything about that. How does that work? Or really? Tell me what that means. What is, he was listening. You know, uh, it's funny, uh, in, the, in the frames of famous people I've worked with uh, that opened this presentation, one of the frames was Carl Malden. 
the Academy Award winning actor uh, on the waterfront, Streetcar Named Desire, uh, on and on and on. And uh, I remember talking with him once and asking, I said, can you tell the difference between a, a good actor and a bad actor? And Carl said, oh yeah, sure, sure. I said, really? He said, well, he said, a good actor, Carl had been like on Streetcar Named, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, oh yeah, Streetcar Named Desire. He'd been on Broadway for, I guess, a couple years doing must've been eight performances a week. And he, he said, a good actor, even though you've done this scene hundreds of times, they're listening to you like this is the first time they've ever heard what you're saying. They're really listening. What is it that's important about it? What, what is it that caught your interest in the first place? I mean, they're really listening to you. He said, bad actors are just waiting for when it's their turn to talk. Let's try to avoid being that person. And I know you know them. I know you've seen them. I know you've encountered them in real life and online, where when someone else is talking, they're just biding their time till they can jump in. Sometimes these people have a need to be the smartest person in the room. Okay. But the smartest person in the room doesn't make lasting bonds. That's something you create. And one of the techniques for using it is actively listening. Again, just like eye contact, just like asking for what you want, this is something you can practice right now, today. If you listen to people, really listen to them, you may be surprised at how your interactions with them are different. It's a, such a simple thing, but it's something that anyone can do. You could do it today. Larry was able to walk me through some uh, different techniques and listening um, practices, and I found it really helpful. We were able to figure out how I could meet this person halfway, and we were really able to become successful in the way that we communicated. Uh, look at this cute family of mine. My wife, I should point out, is also a banana slut few years after me, but still it counts. My son might one day be a banana slug, although right now he has other plans to uh, take over the world. So who knows if he'll bother to stop and get an education in the process. It's anybody's guess. But I want to remind also, I'm not sure if we made this clear at the beginning. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to take any questions you have in real time and answer them. And they really can be about anything having to do with this Wilson method training or the specific uh, remote control revenue that I created that's a great introduction to Wilson method and particularly geared towards earning revenue online. It's very simple. There's a lot of moving parts but they're all things that anyone can do. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom here, it says a phone technique. It's extraordinary how much difference you can make. Little tiny changes, little tiny things that you can do, but we may not have time to get into that even at this point here. Thank you, Larry Wilson for giving me the confidence, giving me the belief, giving me the tools that you teach on your training in order to do that now. And I'm not worried anymore. The fear has gone. You teach empathy on a level that I've never seen or heard ever before in my life. And you take it into such a deep level to really understand um, for your audience. Uh, Lawrence Lamesh from London, uh a character had some amazing things to present. After taking Larry's course, I just, you know, even just the concepts themselves blew my mind. It's a woman, uh, Danielle Rosen, although now she is 
Dr. Daniel Rosen, after a training with me, she uh, went for her PhD and successfully was, uh, I don't know what you call that. I guess she was uh, awarded that PhD. And she felt that part of that was because of the stuff she'd learned in Wilson Method training. Now, you know, I don't want to run over our time for Q&A, but there's a couple people I want you to see. I reached out to Larry Wilson for guidance, and I found that just in one session with Larry, I was able to turn my argument around 180 degrees. I felt welcome, I felt recognized, I felt important. And Larry Wilson can give you this for no cost at all. I love Larry. Um, and I love, I've brought him into our shop a number of times to like talk to our employees and, you know, um, he's got a real gift. Yes, I suppose he does. And Larry sort of uncovered, like, where did that stem from? How did I get? through some of the critical issues that I had going on in my life because I was afraid to have a voice. It was your incredibly precise use of language. It was a use of language that would put most lawyers to shame. <laughs> judge Gary Brown from a federal judge in New York City. Uh, the Larry Wilson method taught me not only to plan what I was going to say, but also how to prep mentally right before I was presenting the keynote. They could all be lying, I guess, <laughs> but they aren't. When I say, what are you waiting for? I want to make sure you understand that wherever you find training to improve your communication, that's what you need to be doing now doesn't have to be me. Uh, in fact, it doesn't have to be anyone. Uh, I, I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for me. Everything that I teach, you could figure out on your own. You could do it by trial and error the way I did, or if you had access to the people I had, you could study them. All that training with me does, and really what Wilson Method does, is it eliminates a 15, 20 year learning curve. That's all. And that's really what I think any mentor should be able to provide you. That the best mentor for you in whatever you're doing, whether it's uh, improving your communication, whether it's learning to hit a golf ball, whether it's learning to cook a souffle, whatever it is, the perfect mentor for you is the one that resonates with you. They're not all the same. It's not one size fits all. So that that's what I think you should really be focused on because everything begins and ends with communication. I am very grateful to have had this time with you. And I wanna make sure that you all understand I think one of the geniuses behind the scenes here, I'm not sure if that's Barbara Oden or Nikki Torres or uh, Eliza Jaffe, one of them will put up in the uh, chat function here, a special something I've created for you. If you go to thewilsonmethod.com, you can look around and you'll see all this great information and I hope that it's interesting to you. But don't click on any, if you're interested, for instance, in learning more about remote control revenue, don't click on it there because uh, it will be very expensive. Instead, I've created something just for banana slugs. If you go to thewilsonmethod.com slash slugs, that's capital S-L-U-G-S. Uh, I created something uh, special for banana slug. That's all I'm gonna say. And uh, I also wanna make it clear, we have a limited amount of time here, but 
I hope that if you have questions, you'll feel free to reach out to me. And on those sites, there's information about how to get to me by text or phone or email or whatever. But in this meantime, if anyone has any questions, I'm going to stop my sharing now. There'll be a couple of moments of tomfoolery as I try to disentangle some of the technology. And I think at that point, Nikki Torres may take over as the moderator for Q&A. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks again. Now, I just need to There I am. Against all conceivable odds, I made that work. Look, there's uh, Matthew Bond is on. Dancy Nelson is on here. This is unbelievable. Those of you who don't know Dancy Nelson, well, of course you wouldn't because we're old dudes. Uh, but Dancy was at College 5 before it was Porter. How fantastic. What a fantastic thing. Um, and there's multiple pages here that I can't necessarily see. I'm not going to worry you about them. I'm going to, well, I will, let me take a look at another page. There's Eliza. Some of these names I know, some of you are new to me. How fantastic. Uh, while Eliza's working on this, if anyone has a question, you could put your finger on your nose if I can see you. Sometimes I'm fooled by your still photos. And like, <laughs> I'm, there's Dancy Nelson live. Well, that must be Dancy Nelson's grandfather because I remember Dancy Nelson very, very well. He's a very young guy. He's a very young guy. Um, you, you, you look great. So good to see you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Good, good to see you. Um, you know, this is so crazy. Now, Dancy Nelson has an extensive background in show business as well. Uh, Dancy working uh, on the uh, on the production side, as opposed to in front of the camera, but uh, also a very talented performer, actor. Uh, great to see you. Absolutely. And, 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 and Larry and I first were on stage together in a production of Guys and Dolls, but he was Nicely Nicely Johnson, uh, circa 1972. And then, of course, I followed your career. And we run into each other a couple times in my 40 years of television, which I retired from, actually, as you were talking early on about retirement, not from life or participation, but making changes yeah. and moving on. Yeah. Well, that I'm I'm astonished. Um, because I still, I'm performing all the time. Um, I, I forget that normal people at a certain point retire from their jobs and then do new things. And so it's always a learning experience for me. People come to me and say, oh yeah, I wanna travel around. And that's why this remote control revenue was so interesting to me because they said, I could be anywhere that I have a internet hookup, I can, do whatever I want. So that seemed like a great idea. Uh, I saw April Yee, I wasn't sure if you were scratching your nose or if you were putting your finger on your nose because you had a question. Um, I don't have a question, but I'm oh. so excited <laughs> to just listen and learn here. Thank you. Well, well forgive me. I'll, I'll say this also because uh, some of you who don't know me may, be, um, may feel a little shy. Uh, I can assure you if I know a guy, look at Dancy Nelson. If I know a guy like that, you can realize there's nothing really to be too alarmed about in interacting with me. Apparently, I'll talk to just about anyone. Uh, yes, Christy. I have a question. Um, so I have a question now that we spend our life on Zoom with the eye contact. Um, do you have any recommendations that are, you know, we're used to making eye contact in person, those of us that don't live on camera. 
<laughs> so right. do you have recommendations well, <clears throat> for like Zoom specifically? Yes, I do. Um, and despite any suggestion to the contrary, I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, but I, I did want to take issue with one thing you said, because you seem to have good eye contact, Chris, but I'm not sure everyone does. And sometimes people think they do. Oh, yeah. Um, you will see the younger people are that you deal with, the less their ability to make eye contact. Now, I have a son. He's now 15 and a half. Uh, and the only reason that's uh, important is because it means he wants a learner's permit to drive and I'll do anything to avoid that discussion. Uh, but I guess there's no way I can prevent that. That's uh, coming whether I like it or not. But he has very good eye contact, but that's because he's my kid. He grew up around this. And I constantly see adults who are freaked out. They'll come up and he said, your kid looked directly at me while he was talking to me. And I'll say, yeah, very strange. So it, uh, rather than becoming a lost art, uh, I'm hoping that uh, some other people pick this up. Um, I'm gonna tell you, I promise, Christy, I'm gonna answer that question, but I just had to acknowledge, I saw Moira, Dancy Nelson's better half behind him there. How wonderful to see another banana slug, a phenomenal dancer. All of these people, of course, we're all in college five. And I don't care how much money Porter gave them, we'll still refer to it as College Five. <clears throat> but I promise, Christy, I'll tell you a very, uh, sometimes you'll notice I, I name people, I'll identify famous people by name. That usually means I had a really positive experience with them. Sometimes I didn't, it was very rare. But sometimes if I don't name someone, it's because there was some uh, unpleasantry. But it doesn't mean I didn't learn something. It just means I don't want to give that any energy. So I won't tell you where I learned this technique, but it's enormously effective. It's silly, but enormously effective. I want you to find a photo of someone that you like. Now, it might be a famous person, might be a movie star or singer or uh, someone like that who you really like or find attractive or might be a good friend of yours who you have a good feeling about. I want you to print out that photo and uh, hopefully it's a face shot where they're looking at you or at least, you know, somehow facing towards you and cut out one of the eyes so that you can mount this photo over your camera so that the camera is looking through that hole you've cut out where their eye is. I realize how silly some of these things sound, but you will be astonished at how much easier it is for you to make eye contact when you feel like you're looking directly at Harrison Ford. Or, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know who people like, but when that photo is up there and you're looking directly into that person's eye, you're looking into your camera lens. And I learned that a long time ago from uh, someone who was very good on camera and did this all the time and would rotate out different photos of people who were in favor or had fallen out of favor with him. Uh, but again, the most important thing, Christy, uh, this, uh, I'm so glad you brought this up because I forget sometimes these techniques and principles are so simple. I forget to reinforce this idea. The most important thing you can do is consistently employ them. If you implement these techniques I'm teaching regularly, I remember years ago, a girl I knew decided she wanted to get in shape for a bathing suit season. So she decided she would do like 5,000 sit-ups and wound up in the hospital because I guess you're not supposed to do 5,000 sit-ups in one sitting. But the point is you're better off doing a few sit-ups every day rather than trying to do everything all at once. When you do that massive surge of, of 
effort, you may get a tiny result, but it's not a lasting result. When you practice these things every day, when you practice active listening, and you know, uh, you have to remember, this is not supposed to be painful. It's not supposed to be punishment. You can do it anywhere. You can do it when you're in the market. You can listen to people who you're not in a conversation with. You can listen to them. When you are in a conversation, I hope that you're listening even more actively. You can make eye contact. Um, I, I thought of an example that sounded pompous, so I'm not going to say that. But uh, was that helpful, Christy? Yeah, that's great. I love it. I'll go look for a picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, oh, yes, uh, Ralph, fire away. Larry, you, you probably don't remember me. Um, college five, 73 through 77-ish. I know or knew at the time many um, of your classmates who enjoyed the poker games in second floor A dorm. Uh, Steve Barron, Brian yes, Bernal, of course. Gus Gillette, uh, who passed away just a, a few years ago. But I'm sorry, uh, I did not know that. It's great to see you. Uh, wonderful presentation today. I wanted to say that, although I, I totally agree that it's it's not just talent. Um, in fact, you know, when, I, when people, when I hear that phrase, you know, oh, he's so talented or she's so talented, in a way it's rather dismissive. Yes. Right, because what what's really driving success, I think, is all the hard work that clearly you've put into your career. And when you say to someone, you know, you're so talented, I think in a way you're attributing their success to something that was, you know, given to them by God or however, you know, whatever your beliefs are, as opposed to how hard they must have worked every day. As you say, not all at once, you know, the surge <laughs> technique right. doesn't work, but the day in, day out attention to the things that you're talking about, that's what gets you to where you want to go. Ralph, um... You seem uh, good to see you, and you sound like a ringer the way you set me up for this because <laughs> you bring up such an important point that I'll tell you a funny story. Um, uh, it's so complicated through this, series, but I was told this by a big Hollywood star who I will not name here because I'm not sure I'm supposed to identify this, but uh, it's about talent, and it's about, I mean, I think talent is an incredible thing. I don't consider myself particularly talented because of what you're just saying. I just see how I busted my butt to learn certain things and practice them. But a talent is an incredible thing to have. And I was told the story about the making of the film Lawrence of Arabia with uh, young Peter O'Toole. Those of you who have never seen this, you would really do well, it's a fantastic film. Um, but this is in the days before computers and CGI and everything. And this director, David Lean, decided he was going to make this, you know, epic about Lawrence of Arabia. And so they're going to shoot on location, you know, in the deserts uh, and, you know, hundreds of mounted soldiers and warriors and all kinds of crazy stuff, enormously expensive. And studios fought with him. No, you can't do it. Anyway, eventually he gets this going and he casts this young a uh, virtually unknown actor, uh, Peter O'Toole as Lawrence, and um, clearly enormously talented guy. So there's this big battle sequence that's referred to in filmmaking stuff as the Battle of Aqaba, where there must be a thousand stunt people on camels and horses with swords and guns and cannons are going off. When you shoot a scene like this, it's so expensive and so many things can go wrong. And it, it's just a, it's a nightmare to shoot a scene like this. And this is what Lean wanted. So they're all set up on the first day and they have all these riders and explosives and horses and camels and stunt people, all this stuff. And they're, 
their trailers for the stars and the first assistant director's job is to go and collect the talent, you know? So the first AD goes over to uh, Peter O'Toole's trailer and knocks on the door. Mr. O'Toole, we're ready for you. He said, the door opens and there's O'Toole in costume, steps out, looks out across this panorama of desert, thousands of people waiting. And O'Toole looks and sniffs the air, goes, no, not today, I don't think so. <laughs> and turns, goes back in his trailer and closes the door and won't come out. And the first AD runs to David Lean, says, Mr. Lean, Mr. Lean, I don't know what to do. I can't get Peter O'Toole. He said, no, not today. And David Lean goes, there's nothing we can do. He's not feeling it. We'll try and shoot some other second unit stuff. We'll try and make use of what we can tomorrow. We'll try again. The next day they did, it worked out fine. It's an incredible sequence. But that's the difference. If, if you're not really in charge of your skills, if you're dependent on some muse or some magical thing that may inspire you or may not, that's a dangerous place to be. And that's why I knew so many of these other people that I worked with and dealt with, they wanted technique. They wanted to have specific systems that they had practiced, that they knew were in their hip pocket, they could pull out any time. So, right. you know, I mean, Ralph, that's exactly what you're speaking to, and I share your sentiment, you know. There, there's nothing wrong with taking the talent that you have, whatever level, right, and just squeezing every last drop of juice out of it. Um, I think that's what most of us do. And then we, we look with admiration at those that seem to do it effortlessly. But I think that even there in the very, very talented people, um, there is a tremendous amount of practice and work that goes into where they, they take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, you know, uh, let me ask if anyone else uh, has another question because uh, something Ralph, uh, said to me, gave me another, uh, oh yes, uh, uh, Fiona, fire away. Hi, Hi. Um, I just wanted to share really quick that um, I've been hard of hearing my whole life. And so I rely on lip reading a lot. Um, and that means looking right at people. <laughs> and I think sometimes it makes people uncomfortable, especially if you don't know them that well. But maybe I should get over that. Um, well, I just, I had a quick question about whether you have any um, advice about how to give better presentations or run meetings at work. Absolutely. Uh, first, let me say, I'm so thrilled uh, that you came here today because it's a fantastic question. Um, you know, uh, and it, it's a, you know, it's funny, it's a great benefit that you have to look directly at people to make sure you're seeing their lips and if anything, this, uh, this whole presentation is turning out to be something different than I imagined, which is great. I'll tell you an interesting story, Fiona. The very first job I ever worked in Las Vegas was as the opening act for Anne Margaret at Caesar's Palace. Now, Fiona, you look a little too young. You might not know who Anne Margaret was, but suffice to say, she was the most beautiful woman in the world. And she was an actress and singer and dancer. She was a fantastic entertainer. Um, many films, um, suspecting before you were born, a uh, Bye Bye Birdie. And uh, she was with Elvis in Viva Las Vegas. Uh, oh, the, anyway, I could go on and on. And she was this stunningly beautiful woman. When I worked with her, the first job, I was working with her after she had been in a terrible accident. On stage performing, she was up on a scaffolding, a, a piece of scenery that gave way and she fell 15 feet onto the stage on her face and terrible, terrible injuries. And uh, was meta out of there to save her life and 
have her whole face reconstructed. And I knew about that. But when I saw her, she looked great because her makeup artist had created a makeup that kind of adjusted for everything, made her look okay. A couple, maybe a week into the run, I was with her. There was a knock at the door, my dressing room, and I opened it. This is after the show. There's Ann Margaret in a sweatshirt and jeans with her hair up in a towel, I think, and her face completely washed clean, not a speck of makeup on. And I could see there was a horrible, jagged scar that started at her hairline and went down across her nose, across an eye socket, and her face was slightly out of symmetry. It was kind of, and I fell in love with her at that moment. I always thought she was beautiful and I was a huge fan. But when I saw her like that, I thought this woman is so unpretentious, is so unselfconscious. I thought I would walk through fire for this person. And the fact that I'm telling you the story now shows that I still feel that way. If you feel or talk to someone and you get a feeling maybe they feel a little funny that you're staring at them. If you tell them, if you are self-effacing, if you say, oh, uh, I know I may seem a little odd the way I'm staring at you, but I have difficulty hearing. And so I really rely on seeing your lip movement and I really want to hear what you have to say. Those people will never forget you. And anything you say to them, they're going to hear you. They're going to see you. You will be impossible to ignore. Now, I, I somehow digressed, as is my wont to do, because you were asking about presentations. And... Uh, Absolutely, for people who present either from the stage. Now, obviously, you know, I told you about this uh, remote control revenue. This was something that I was specifically training people for people who are trapped and have to use the internet for whatever reason. But before last year, all the Wilson Method training I did was in person. And sometimes I would do larger groups. I would do a two-day boot camp. And it was limited to just 10 people because it really was like a boot camp. I was making you do stuff. I was making you do things on camera and I was making you stand up and speak and uh, training you in your voice. Um, uh, I was trained by a guy named Erwin Winward. I didn't realize at the time uh, how, what a big deal he was. I just stumbled into it like so many other things in my life. And I teach Erwin Winward's uh, techniques of, of warming your voice and being able to use your voice and things like that. But in that two-day boot camp, we spent a lot of time working on presentation because a number of people who are taking the boot camp with me are um, people, I don't know if this is, applies to you, but are people who have to go out in front of large groups and make presentations. And there are, again, very specific um, I've got to, I, I'm keeping my eye on the clock because I promised I would not run over here. But I'll tell you, <laughs> I, I don't know if you can see me flipping through a Rolodex in my head as I think about what may be most useful for you. Um, yeah. Fiona, you have great eye contact. Now, of course, we're talking about it, so maybe it's uppermost in your mind. But, all right, <laughs> if I start to run over, I'll try and cut myself off. You make me think of two things. One, you have a great smile and it's a authentic smile. Now, Ralph Robinson mentioned that I played a lot of poker when I was at Santa Cruz and I'm guilty as charged, a lot of late nights playing poker. This, of course, served me very well in show business because I was frequently performing in casinos. I'd only work an hour a night, 
And then I had nothing else to do with myself. So in Las Vegas and Lake Tahoe, and I'd wind up playing poker. And I learned some incredible things from really great poker players. Uh, because I can sometimes be amusing, they took a pity on me, I think. And a couple of really good players at one point pulled me aside and said, you don't really understand this game, do you? I said, yes, I do. They said, no, you, you really don't. And so they started teaching me things and uh, it was incredible. So I became a much better player. One of the things, there was a guy who ostensibly, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say, but ostensibly was in law enforcement. And uh, I saw him make a play against someone where it's a gigantic pot and someone he'd made a raise and at the, it was the very final round of betting and this other player had pushed all in a huge stack of chips. And this guy I'm referring to thought a long time and finally called, it turned out the other guy was bluffing. And so the guy I was referring to won the pot. And I followed him, I think into the men's room and uh, said, you got to explain to me how you made that call. I don't, and he said, well, let me finish here and I'll come out and talk to you about it. So then he came out and he said, he said, you didn't see what was going on with that guy? I said, no. He said, you didn't see his smile? I said, no, I don't know what's going on. He said, when your smile is authentic, it's symmetrical. When people try to smile, but they aren't really happy about something, their smile is asymmetrical. It's this kind of, you know, lopsided thing. And he said to me, he said, didn't you notice I kept talking to that guy? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, I was just trying to get a reaction from him. And eventually I said to him, am I supposed to think you have a full house? And the guy gave me this weird lopsided smile. So I knew that he was bluffing. It wasn't real. Well, even if you don't play poker, which I actually haven't had time for years to play, but in life, you'll see this all the time. We don't want you to go out on stage and do some tortured, mangled kind of look that's supposed to be a smile. Now, of course, the question is, well, then how do you do it? And this is the only reason I started thinking I'm going to run out of time here. A few years back, quite a few years back, actually, I was performing with my stage troupe at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. And one of the hosts came back after our show and said, oh, there's a guest who'd like to say hello to you. I said, great. Uh, so the host opened the door and in walks Cary Grant. Now, again, Fiona, I don't know how old you are, so I don't know if Cary Grant means anything to you, but this is a guy who's a gigantic movie star in the 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe the most elegant, suave, dashing. Look, you can see Dancy and Moira are nodding, going like this, going, yeah, incredibly handsome. Man. And where sometimes when you meet show business people, they aren't quite as spectacular as they are on camera. Just telling you that Cary Grant was every bit, he was completely, he was tall and slender and beautifully dressed and immaculately coiffed. He was the classiest thing I'd ever seen. And my troupe and I were sort of huddled together and we could not speak. We are so freaked out that it was him. And he was so kind. He was just saying, and now I'm going to do a really bad impression. So this isn't really what he sounds like. He said, oh, I thought that was fabulous. You were good. And he's saying all these very nice things. And we were just all, oh, oh, like this. And I can't tell you how long he talked to us. Maybe 10 minutes? I don't know. But he was very flattering. He wanted to know where I worked in Vegas and he wanted to know some other things. We talked about stuff. And then he said, well, I know you have another show coming up. I'll, I'll let you go. And as he stepped up the door, he turned and looked back at me and said, Larry Wilson, think good thoughts. And I sort of went, okay. Uh, why? 
And he said, because it shows on your face. And I thought, of course it does. Well, this is the key. It's as simple as this. If I'm going out to speak to a group, all of us, you know, um, there's a series of, of trainings I do that fall under the rubric of how to talk to humans. And I'm the first one to say, if you're a zombie, if you're from outer space, if you're a werewolf, I can't help you. But I'm very good with humans. And all of us who are human have very similar feelings. We want people to like us. And sometimes we're nervous when we have to get up in front of a group and speak if we don't know them. And it's hard to have a smile on your face. But if you, Fiona, think of something, and you can, again, practice this with a video camera or with your phone recording you, if you think of something that's pleasing to you, it could be a friend, could be a loved one, it could be a meal, could be a pet, so many things. Could be an experience that you remember where something happened. Um, I, I told uh, uh, Barbara, I think, I told Barbara Odin, just before we came on here, I made a mistake. I was thinking about something to do with this presentation. I, I thought of Carly Simon singing, uh, Let the River Run. And so I brought it up on YouTube and it brought me to tears. It was so powerful. I thought, Larry, you're such an idiot. You have to go on camera here now. And now you're weeping, you know? This is the power our feelings have to affect how we look, what we call facial affect. If you think of something, Fiona, that warms your heart, that is the happiest day of your life, it's going to show on your face. Now, I'm not saying that you're supposed to pretend. If you're coming out to make some presentation to a group of undertakers, I'm not saying that you're supposed to pretend that makes you happy to be with undertakers. But it doesn't matter. And I, I hope I'm being clear about I'm trying to condense some training down from a two-day uh, boot camp into just a moment or two, but I'm not saying that the audience should be able to look at you and understand what you're thinking. They don't have to do that. I want them to look at you and know that you, Fiona, are feeling something. That's all. They don't have to know what it is but they have to know that you feel something. If you look back on this uh, replay, I don't know if there will be a real, I guess it may be. If you go back and look at the photo of my mother and father together, my mother is so filled with joy of life. It's, it's pouring out of her like she's a stained glass window. And my father, who is not a bad person, but, it's kind of blank. We don't feel that he's feeling anything. And unfortunately, that may be accurate. Now, they're both gone. I can't ask them. I don't know. Maybe he did feel, but the few times I would try to talk with him about things like this, he would talk about feelings in an intellectual way, which is kind of missing the point, right? I want you, Fiona, before you have to get up and make a presentation, before you walk out to see them, to think of that thing, whatever that thing is. Because when you walk on stage with a smile on your face, with some feeling inside you, they feel it. That's connecting before you've said a word. And I'll tell you another thing. Uh, and this applies to everyone. This is not just Fiona, but that idea of self-effacing behavior. People in the audience, when you're making a presentation, 
they know how scary that can be. They feel tremendous empathy for you. They Now, truthfully, I have never felt afraid to go on stage, probably because I'm not smart enough to be worried about that. I just figure, oh, well, whatever happens, that'll be fine. But normal people sometimes think, oh, what if I hiccuped or burped or something? In my experience, if you were to burp in the middle of introducing yourself, there are some people who try to, I'll just pretend that didn't happen. That's not my recommendation. The audience feels the way you feel. And if you say, oh, <laughs> well, I guess I should have avoided those tacos before this presentation. Or you could say anything. But if you acknowledge that you're a human being, if you're walking forward on the stage and your foot catches and you stumble a little bit, you could say, that's what happens when you buy feet at a garage sale. Or, I mean, now see, Barbara's laughing at that, but that's not really that funny a joke. What the reason she's laughing is because it's a release of tension. We all in the audience want you to succeed. I can't tell you the number of famous comedians I've met and worked with who talked about how the audience is hostile. The audience is hostile. I've never, ever experienced this in my life. I suppose if you bring that attitude, then maybe that's what you get. My experience has been that audiences, and if you think about yourself as an audience member, we want the person on stage to succeed. We want them to say something fascinating. We want them to be hilarious. We want them to be charming. We want to share what they have. And we look at them and think, that person's brave to be able to get up there and do that. There are people not in thinking, I could never do that. And if you keep that in mind, they're not adversaries. They're humans, they're just like you. If you acknowledge that you're a human, then they will fall in love with you. They may not know why, they may not be able to articulate it. It may not be conscious on their part, but they will feel like, oh my God, this woman Fiona, she's so great. And this is why it's also puzzling sometimes to performers. Sometimes performers might not do their best performance, but the audience loves them so much. Well, it's because they connected with that audience. And as far as I'm concerned, in terms of Wilson Method Communications training, that's our, my highest admonition is I want you to connect. I want you to connect before you've even spoken a word, but I want you to connect so that you can communicate and create authentic bond. And uh, I don't mean to be um, glossing over this. There are obviously a great many more parts, but a lot of uh, the nervousness we feel before making a presentation is our fear of being judged. It is the same reason sometimes we have difficulty making that eye contact with a camera, sometimes making eye contact with an audience. I'm sure you've seen a speaker who looks over the heads of the audience or looking at the back of the room. They're afraid to look directly at the people they're communicating with. What could they be afraid of? Well, my experience, the only thing we can ever be afraid of is being judged. We're afraid that someone's going to go, you're an idiot, or who dressed you, or how did you get it, you know, but the fact, that, and, and maybe there's somebody who will do that sometime. Well, here's an incredibly valuable lesson I'm going to give you for free here. No matter how much you might embarrass yourself on stage, there have been no recorded incidents of anyone dying from embarrassment. And this is very, very important information because 
I consider death to be the big impediment to success. As long as you don't die, I think you're doing pretty good. You can always keep practicing. You can always get better. When you die, it slows things down a little bit. Yes, Nikki. I was just going to oh. give you a little um, time reminder. We're two minutes to 1.30. You did it perfectly. And I, of course, got carried away. Um, I can't thank you all enough. I wish we had more time. But I want to throw this back uh, to Christy Martin, I think, who's going to wrap yep. things up for us. And I will simply remind you of this. If you have other questions, other ideas, go to thewilsonmethod.com slash slugs. There's some link on there that you can get a hold of me. Uh, you can speak to me on the phone, whatever. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic to see old friends like Dan Dempsey and Moira. Ralph, good to see you. And thank you again, all of you for being here. It's been fantastic. Take it away, Christy Martin. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Larry. This was fun. Uh, I'm going to go try out my new Zoom eye contact skills and think happy thoughts about my pet chicken before I go into my meeting this afternoon. That's it. <laughs> Um, and thank you everyone else for joining. If you have any questions or feedback, if you're interested in volunteering in any way through the Alumni Association, um, email alumni at ucsc.edu. And I think Barbara's gonna drop all these links in the chat for you. Um, we also wanted to share the Alumni Week crowdfunding site and encourage gifts of any size to one of the five, I think there's five funds that are featured there. Um, you know, I'm of course biased to the Alumni Association Scholarship Fund. And if you wanna learn more about that, there's an article, I think it's the March UCSC Magazine that does a profile on the fund and some of the student recipients, which is really exciting. And that wraps it up. There's, I think there's 70 events throughout the week and registration's still open. So hopefully you can join them and uh, connect with old friends. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Thank My pleasure. Thanks, Larry. Thank you, Larry. And thanks to the staff, the amazing job organizing all of this yes. whole week. Thank you, everybody. Great Eliza, to see you, Larry. Nikki. Great to see you. Thanks, thanks Dan. Thanks.